in the moonlight. If now must pause the bullock's jingling tune, here let it be, beneath the dreaming trees, supine and huge that hang upon the breeze, here in the wide eye of the silent moon. How living a stillness reigns. The night's hushed rules all things obey, but three. The slow winds sigh among the leaves, the cricket's ceaseless cry, the frog's harsh discord in the ringing pools. Yet they but seem the silence to increase, and dreadful wideness of the inhuman night the whole hushed world, immeasurable, might be watching round this single spot of peace. So boundless is the darkness, and so rife with thoughts of infinite reach, that it creates a dangerous sense of space, and abrogates the wholesome littleness of human life. The common round that each of us must tread now seems a thing unreal. We forget the heavy yoke the world on us has set, the slave's vain labour, earning tasteless bread. Space hedges us, and time our hearts o'ertakes. Our bounded senses and our boundless thought strive through the centuries and are slowly brought back to the source whence their divergence wakes the source that none have traced, since none can know whether from heaven the eternal waters well through nature's matted locks as Ganges fell or from some dismal nether darkness flow. Two genii in the dubious heart of man, two great unhappy foes together bound, wrestle and strive to win unhampered ground. They strive forever since the race began. One from his body, like a bridge of fire, mounts upward, Asia winged with eager eyes. One in his brain, deep mansioned, laboring lies and clamps to earth the spirit's high desire. Here, in this moonlight, with strange visions rife, I seem to see their vast peripheries, without me in the somber mighty trees. And hark, their silence turns the wheels of life. These are the middle and the first. Are they the last two? Has the duel then no close? Shall neither vanquish of the eternal foes, nor even at length this moonlight turn to day? Our age has made an idol of the brain, the last adored a purer presence. Yet, in Asia, like a dove immaculate he looks, deep brooding in the hearts of men. But Europe comes to us, bright-eyed and shrill. A far delusion was that mounting fire, an impulse balked and an unjust desire. It fades as we ascend the human hill. She cries to us to labour in the light of common things, grow beautiful and wise on strong material food, nor vex our eyes with straining after visionary delight. Ah, beautiful and wise, but to what end? Europe knows not, nor any of her schools who scorn the higher thought for dreams of fools, riches and joy and power meanwhile are gained, gained and then lost. For death, the heavy grip shall loosen. Death shall cloud the laughing eye, and he who broke the nations soon shall lie more helpless than a little child asleep. And after, 
nay, for death's end and turn. A fiery dragon through the centuries curled, he feeds upon the glories of the world, and the vast mammoth dies before the worm. Stars run their cycles and are quenched. The suns born from the night are to the night returned, when the cold tenebrous spaces have inurned the listless phantoms of the shining ones. From two dead worlds, a burning world arose, of which the late putrescent fruit is man. From chill, dark space, his role of life began and shall again in icy quiet close. Our lives are but a transitory breath, mean pismires in the sad and dying age of a once glorious planet. On the edge of bitter pain we wait eternal death, watering the ages with our sweat and blood. We pant towards some vague ideal state and by the effort fiercer ills create, working by lasting evil, transient good. Insults and servitude we bear perforce, with profitable crimes our souls we rack, vexing ourselves lest earth our seed should lack, who needs us not in her perpetual course. Then down into the earth descend and sleep forever, and the lives for which we toiled forget us, who when they turn have moiled themselves forgotten into silent sleep. Why is it all, the labour and the din? And wherefore do we plague our souls and vex our bodies, or with doubts our days perplex? Death levels soon the virtue with the sin. If death be end and close the useless strife, strive not at all, but take what ease you may and make a golden glory of the day. Exhaust the little honey of your life Fear not to take her beauty to your heart, whom you so utterly desire. You do no hurt to any, for the inner you so cherished is a dream that shall depart. The wine of life is sweet. Let no man stint his longing or refuse one passionate hope. Why should we cabin in such infinite scope, restrict the issue of such golden mint? Society forbids. It, for our sakes, was fashioned. If it seeks to fence around our joys and pleasures in such narrow bound, it gives us little for the much it takes. No need we hearken to the gospel vein that bids men curb themselves to help mankind. We lose our little chance of bliss. Then, blind and silent, lie forever. Who's the gain? What helps? What helps it us, if so mankind be served? Ourselves are blotted out from joy and light, having no profit of the sunshine bright, while others reap the fruit our toils deserved. O oh, this new God who has replaced the old, he dies today, he dies tomorrow, dies at last forever, and the last sunrise shall have forgotten him, extinct and cold. But virtue to itself is joy enough, yet if to us sin taste diviner, why should we not heard in Epicurus' sty from nature made not of a stoic stuff? For nature being all, desire must reign. It is too sweet and strong for us to slay upon a nameless altar, saying nay to honeyed urgings for no purpose plain. A strange, unreal gospel science brings, being animals to act as angels might. Mortals we must put forth immortal might and flutter in the void celestial wings. Ephemeral creatures, for the future live, she bids us, gather in for unborn men knowledge and joy, and for feet nor complain the present, which alone is yours to give. 
man's immortality she first denies and then assumes what she rejects. Made blind by sudden knowledge, the majestic mind within her smiling at her sophistries. Not so shall truth extend her flight sublime, pass from the poor beginnings she has made, and with the splendor of her wings displayed, range through the boundaries of space and time, clamp her not down to her material finds. She shall go further. She shall not reject the light within, nor shall the dialect of unprogressive pedants bar men's minds. We seek the truth and will not pause nor fear. Truth we will have and not the sophists please. Animals we will take our groceries or oh, spirits, heaven's celestial music here. The intellect is not all. A guide within awaits our question. He it is. He it was, informed the reason. He surpasses and unformed presages of his mightiness begin. No mind submerged, no self subliminal, but the great force that makes the planets wheel through ether and the sun in flames reveal his Godhead is in us, perpetual. That force in us is body, that is mind. And what is higher than the mind is he. This was the secret science could not see. Aware of death, to life her eyes were blind. Through chemistry she sees the source of life, nor knows the mighty laws that she has found are nature's bylaws, merely meant to ground the grandiose freedom building peace by strife. The organ for the thing itself she takes, the brain for mind, the body for the soul. Nor has she patience to explore the whole, but like a child, a hasty period makes. It is enough, she says, I have explored the whole of being. Nothing now remains but to put details in and count my gains. So she deceives herself, denies her Lord. Therefore, he manifests himself. Once more the wonders of the secret world within, wrapped yet with an uncertain mist, begin to look from that thick curtain out. The door opens. Her days are numbered, and not long shall she be suffered to be little thus man and restrain from his tempestuous uprising that immortal spirit strong. He rises now, for God has taken birth. The revolutions that pervade the world are faint beginnings, and the discus hurled of Vishnu speeds down to enring the earth. The old shall perish, it shall pass away, expunged, annihilated, blotted out, and all the iron bands that ring about man's wide expansion shall at last give way. Freedom, God, immortality. The three are one and shall be realized at length. Love, wisdom, justice, joy and utter strength gather into a pure felicity. It comes at last the day foreseen of old. What John in Patmos saw, what Shelley dreamed, vision and vain imagination deemed, the city of delight, the age of gold. The Iron Age is ended. Only now the last fierce spasm of the dying past shall shake the nations and 
when that has passed, earth, washed of ills, shall raise a fairer brow. This is man's progress. For the Iron Age prepares the age of gold. What we call sin is but man's leavings, as from deep within the pilot guides him in his pilgrimage, he leaves behind the ill with strife and pain because it clings and constantly returns. And in the fire of suffering, fiercely burns more sweetness to deserve, more strength to gain. He rises to the good with titan wings, and this the reason of his high unease, because he came from the infinities to build immortally with mortal things. The body, with increasing soul to fill, extend heaven's claim upon the toiling earth, and climb from death to a diviner birth, grasped and supported by immortal will.